basically, so with insulin resistance, the simplest definition, and you kind of mentioned this, it's just when insulin isn't working the right way at various cells in the body. Now, at some cells, insulin's working perfectly fine, but at other cells, it is not. And that imbalance actually becomes a problem when we appreciate the fact that in a body that is insulin resistant, insulin levels themselves are much, much higher than before. So those two features come together. Insulin isn't working the right way um, throughout the body and insulin levels it's themselves or itself is much higher. So some cells that are continuing to respond to insulin normally now are hyperactive with their insulin. Insulin is now telling the cell to do too much and the cell is sensitive to that signal and so it keeps doing too much. But then other cells aren't really getting the signal very well at all. So those two variables are what comes into play making insulin resistance the problem that it is. And in this, we could, we could almost, and I, as you know from going through the book, it is shocking how many diseases, chronic diseases that we think would have no metabolic origins actually have at their core an, an unavoidable metabolic origin. Like for example, the, the hyperinsulinemia that comes with the high insulin levels that someone has in insulin resistance, if we look at what that does at the ovaries in a woman, it's profound. The most common form of infertility in women is a disease called polycystic ovarian syndrome, where the, 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 the ovaries are going through the um, menstrual cycle. The woman is going through the menstrual cycle. The ovaries are developing a lot of little eggs every month, but in order for the, all the rest of the eggs to go away, one of them must ovulate. And with that one egg ovulating from one of the ovaries, then all the other kind of budding little eggs will, will, will go away. But in the absence of one ovulating, all of those little eggs stick around and they become these big cysts in the ovaries. And that problem happens because the woman doesn't get this big estrogen spike, which she needs immediately preceding ovulation. This big estrogen spike and one other hormone, well, many hormones come into play, but estrogen spike is a big one. Too much insulin blocks the ovaries from making that big estrogen spike. Insulin inhibits the process whereby, in fact, this is fascinating, but all estrogen hormones were once testosterone. The ovaries convert the testosterone into the estrogens. And this happens in men and women. Of course, in women, it happens more, and women thus have higher estrogen levels than men. But that one enzyme that um, mediates that conversion from testosterone to estrogens is inhibited by insulin. And so the woman who has insulin resistance and high insulin levels at the level of the, at her ovaries, the insulin is directly preventing that big estrogen surge, preventing ovulation. And as a background problem, she has too much testosterone and she'll, she'll, she'll start to have other problems like more coarse body hair, for example, um, that, that the, or acne, um, like you might have even like in a young boy, in, a, in an adolescent yeah. boy who's going through a big testosterone surge. So so that's a problem at the ovaries. When we look at the brain, um, some of the brain's energy comes from glucose, from the blood, and insulin mediates some of that movement of the glucose into the brain. And so when the brain becomes insulin resistant, it can't get enough of its energy from glucose anymore. And so there's this kind of gap of energy. You know, the brain's energetic need is up here, Glucose used to give all of it to the brain, but now the brain's become insulin resistant. And now we have the, it, it, the, this gap where the glucose can't meet the need. And, and the person starts to develop brain disorders, including Alzheimer's disease and including migraines, frankly. Even migraines are looked at as a bit of an energetic deficit in the brain. So I could keep going. We could talk about muscles, bones, joints, liver, um, kidneys, eyes, it, it, it suffice it to say virtually every chronic disease has some connection to insulin resistance where the insulin resistance is either explicitly causing the problem or it's exacerbating it or accelerating the problem. Okay. All right. So what I'm hearing from you here is that insulin resistance isn't just a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. We haven't actually really even touched on that yet. You've talked about all these other conditions that insulin resistance is the precursor for. But yet most people will tend to think that it's type 2 diabetes that is the, the biggest risk factor or the only thing we're likely to get if we're insulin resistant. But that's clearly not the case. 
No, that's right. Yeah. In fact, it's it's not even it's far from a guarantee that the person would progress to full on type two diabetes. What is far more likely is that they would have hypertension, so high blood pressure, fatty liver disease. They may and, and in a woman, they she would have polycystic ovarian syndrome. A man would have erectile dysfunction. That's also a, a common early symptom or sign of insulin resistance. Yes. Mm -hmm. So waiting, that, and that's part of the problem. And, and I do emphasize the word waiting. When we look at insulin resistance strictly through the lens of type 2 diabetes, it is unfair to the hormone insulin, which I believe is the more relevant one. And, and we shift our focus to glucose. But the tragedy of that perspective is that as someone, if we look at all metabolic health as just this process or just through the lens of glucose, as if it's like a progression just towards type two diabetes, then we're only looking at the glucose and we fail to acknowledge the reality that behind the scenes underlying that normal glucose is this ever increasing insulin level uh, that the, where the body has to work harder and harder. The insulin has to work harder and harder in order to keep that glucose in check. That is the insulin resistance. But if we, in other words, if we looked at the insulin, we would have detected the problem potentially decades, 10 or 20 years before the glucose would have changed. But we don't look at insulin. It has not made its way into just the common clinical diagnostic when someone comes in for a conventional or just routine lab visit. We always measure glucose. We always measure lipids. And I think those are fine. They certainly have value. But if we really want to detect insulin resistance, we've got to bring in insulin. We have to allow it into the discussion. We do, but as you say, it's not a standard test. In fact, just yesterday, a client told me that a doctor refused to check it because I give a recommended list of what are their blood tests to go and ask for, for you, from your doctor, and one of them is fasting insulin. No, wouldn't do it. And, yeah. you know, it, it is when you understand what you're saying that this is going to give us, you know, tell us what's going on with our metabolic health 10 to 20 years prior to being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or you know, of course, we know PCOS for females. That's usually very, you know, teenagers are, get, are getting yes. that. And then, of course, you know, um, breast cancer is another big one. I, you know, I, I know you've spoken about and being mostly women listening to this podcast, that's something I'd love to, to talk about yes. as well. But it's so, why? How? Why is this happening? <laughs> oh, I know, isn't it? Well, I, I often say that it, it, it's, it, it was forgivable. It was forgivable that the focus was exclusively on glucose because of two reasons. One, traditionally, the most obvious sign of diabetes was the ex excessive urine production, what we call polyuria. The person was just urinating gallons and gallons of water, every of urine every day. And that was because of the high glucose. And we knew that even early physicians, hundreds, thousands of years ago, because the, the, glu the urine was enriched with the glucose uh, and they'd see animals, dogs would want to come and lick up that glucose and the flies would just swarm to it to eat all those sugars from the urine. And so the most obvious symptom, polyuria, was directly a result of the high glucose levels. And then second, second reason why it was forgivable is that scientifically we were able to measure glucose from the blood far, far earlier than we could ever measure insulin. So we just, we had the technology to measure this molecule when we did not have the technology to measure insulin. And even nowadays, as you just mentioned, it, it, it's getting insulin measured is not a simple test. It is a full on blood test at the lab. And it often incurs a cost that depending on the, the healthcare model or in the US, the insurance that a person has, it, it just, it, it might not get covered. And so the, the, the physician may be reluctant, even if the physician appreciates the value of insulin, they may be reluctant simply because they know the insurance won't pay for this, I can't bill it, and the patient doesn't wanna pay for it, then I have to get in a fight with the patient. So yeah. it's, it's unfortunate, but given how it is getting easier and easier to measure insulin, uh, tip, these costs are coming down it's getting less forgivable to not measure insulin. Now, 